Thank you, everybody. Excited to be here uh, speaking to this amazing audience, amazing energy in the room. I was walking around earlier and just felt the, the momentum from everybody. Um, so I always like to start, uh, let me see if my clicker's working. Um, I always like to start a talk by telling people a little bit about myself. Um, and you know, Rebecca went through a couple of my uh, career milestones as well, but I want to double click into it for a second. So about a decade ago, I used to work for Amazon and I was the product manager of the Kindle Fire tablet, if anybody's ever used one of those. A couple of a couple hand raises in the crowd, okay, great. Um, I then worked at Twitter on service infrastructure. So my job was making sure Twitter was reliable, fast, cost efficient, work globally. Um, so I was actually one of the few PMs in the engineering organization at Twitter. Um, I then worked at Box, uh, leading the developer products business. So I actually grew a B2B product from less than 10 million in ARR to over 30 million over the course of a couple of years. And lastly, and now uh, the last three and a half years, I've been at Amplitude leading our core product team, uh, which is focused on analytics. Now I'm telling you all this not to give you a recap of my resume, which you can read on LinkedIn. I'm telling you all this to highlight there's a bunch of different types of product work, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, right? I think we have about 2,000 people in the audience. And so I'm sure there are people here who have done all kinds of product work whether it is zero to one product work like I did on the Kindle, which is creating a brand new product from scratch, whether it is what is called platform product, which is owning services and infrastructure and the backend that powers vertical product development, whether it is actually scaling a business, right, where you've found product market fit, but you're actually trying to figure out the go to market side of it and grow your revenue base and your retention. Um, or whether it's actual core product work, where you have a core user base, you're continuing to innovate around features and maintain your lead. And the reason I want to highlight these different types of product work, which I'm sure many of you participate in, is no matter what kind of product work you're doing, ultimately you're going to have to connect it to the bottom line. No matter whether you're doing new product, platform product, scaling product, or core product, your executive team, your leaders, your CEO, your CFO, your investors, your board are going to ask you, how does that product work that you're doing connect to revenue? Um, it's something I've had to deal with in every job, and I'm sure a lot of you have to deal with it as well. Now, how can I possibly know that all of you have to deal with this problem of connecting product work to revenue? How could I possibly know? Any guesses? Anybody want to shout it out? No? Sit. I know because I see the things you post on Twitter. <laughs> so here's a randomly selected tweet that I saw a couple of months ago um, that is sort of uh, an example of the types of questions people ask. Usually some PM will come along and say, I've been asked to come up with a North Star metric. My leadership team only cares about revenue. What do I do now? This is usually how the topic of conversation starts. By the way, I did not make up these tweets. These are, these are real tweets that you can go find. Um, so you have to come up with a North Star metric. Leadership cares about revenue. What do you do now? First, there's denial. Why does leadership only care about revenue? Shouldn't they care about usage and adoption and engagement? What is leadership's problem? So first, you sort of push back gently. Then somebody says, look, it's really not about revenue. It's about what people are doing with your product. We should talk to our users. We should understand what they're trying to solve, what the use cases are, et cetera. So this guy really wants to apply product thinking. Then somebody says, but how do we ultimately monetize our product? That's what we should be looking at, right? What aspect of usage is the thing that actually leads to people paying us money? And then people usually come along and say, well, here's a bunch of buffet of menus that you could track. Active users, signups, retention. Oh, how about customer lifetime value? So now we're in the mode of let's just throw out a bunch of metrics and see if one of those sticks. Then there's frustration. There is no good metric. Why are we trying to come up with one metric? This is a fruitless exercise. Let's stop trying to do this. Why isn't leadership interested in the value? Why is leadership so focused on revenue? So we're back in our denial state. 
I, and this is a very long Twitter thread. I actually just picked the, the best tweets I could find. Uh, there's a couple more. Uh, usually somebody comes along and assumes certain things connect to revenue. They're like, maybe usage connects to revenue. Maybe uptime connects to revenue. So you're starting to look for ways to connect the work you're doing to revenue, but you can't definitively prove it. Of course, there's somebody who says, I'm not a fan of a single metric. There's actually a bunch of different metrics we should track. So stop trying to artificially constrain me to one metric. But again, leadership is gonna push you for one metric and to show that it connects to revenue. And then there's always somebody, no offense to analysts, who comes along and says, how about a bunch of random stuff? Maybe that's the metric we should track. Let's obfuscate the problem and just confuse everybody. That's probably not gonna work either. And then there's the person who says, well, you know what we already track? We already track DAU. So maybe we should just keep tracking the thing we've always tracked and that connects to revenue. Of course, somebody's gonna come along and say, the whole business model is wrong. Why are we even in this business? Why are we worrying about a metric? We should change the business we're in. Obviously, you can't do that overnight. Then you start offending the person who asked the question. <laughs> It's a poorly constructed question. Why are you even asking me this question? By the way, has anybody ever tried this with their leadership team? Your question is irrelevant. It's, it's not gonna fly. And then, by the way, this is me. Uh, you can't tell because I'm wearing a wig on Twitter. But uh, eventually is the cold hard practicality, which is you don't quite know what your users are doing. You do know what leadership cares about. So in a world where you have these constraints, maybe you come up with a best case scenario and you use it as a starting point, and then you go from there. Um, so why am I sharing this Twitter thread with you, right? To go back to the beginning, I wanted to sort of empathize with the reality that all of you deal with. So let's talk about that reality. The first is, no matter what you do, you're gonna be asked to show a connection to revenue. But it doesn't stop there. Problem number one is there's so many different inputs in order to show how the work connects to revenue. There's too many dimensions at play here. That's number one. Number two, as we saw in the Twitter thread, sorry, I can't call it X, I call it Twitter. I used to work at Twitter. Um, the number two is you don't have a complete picture. You might hear bits and pieces from your power users, from support tickets, from your sellers, from sales, from support, but nobody has a full picture of what is actually leading to usage, adoption, monetization, renewal, et cetera, right? It gets even worse. There is a strong desire in the organization for a single, simple metric that ties everything together in a neat bow, right? And, and people want to make sure it is easily tracked and reported. Because if your metric is so convoluted that an analyst needs to run a query once a month, it's not the kind of thing you can actually track on a regular basis and explore and reason about and make decisions around. And then getting to the other side of this branch, if you have an incomplete picture, you're gonna be struggling to figure out what actually correlates to revenue what actually has a causal impact on ge revenue generation. And I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with this issue, which is if all is lost, you just start focusing on are we shipping anything at all, and we start focusing on the output versus actually worrying about the outcome, which should be that connection to revenue. So this is sort of the mental decision tree of you're asked to own a metric and you're asked to show how it connects to revenue. And this is the problem that all of us at one point or another whatever kind of product work we're doing, are gonna be asked to solve. So let's talk about revenue. As I said earlier, there's two different facets to revenue. One is there's many, many different inputs that feed into it, and two is you don't have a complete picture. What if we leaned into that multiple input aspect of it to actually try to complete the picture for ourselves? So I like to think about revenue in three different buckets. And I, whenever I talk to leadership about revenue, I try to steer them towards one of these three buckets. Um, and by the way, this applies to every kind of business, every kind of product, whether it's B2C, B2B, B2D, new products, old products, legacy products, cloud products, whatever have you, which is 
You have to make revenue. People actually have to pay you for the product and service you provide, which is obvious. And it's actually where most people's minds go when you say revenue. But you also have to preserve revenue. The revenue that you've booked, the income that you've made, you actually have to hang on to it. Customers have to stick around. They have to renew. They have to expand, right? And then lastly, and most people neglect this, especially in our industry over the last few years, but not anymore, is you have to sustain that revenue. If it costs you a dollar to make 50 cents, that's not a sustainable business, right? Um, and so these are the three different facets of revenue that come up all the time. How do you make it? How do you preserve it? And how do you sustain it? And this is not some framework that I made up. This is a very common set of terminology used across all product teams and all businesses, which is making money is called growth, preserving that money is called retention, and doing it in a sustainable way is called margins. These are the three different buckets of revenue mapping that a lot of leaders understand. So when your leadership team says, how does this connect to revenue? The question you can ask them is, what kind of revenue are you worrying about? Are you worrying about generating new money saving the money we have or doing it in a sustainable fashion. Now I can see the gears turning for all of you because I've given this talk before and I've taught classes around this and a lot of times people struggle with my team does not actually contribute to revenue and that's just not true. The reality is every piece of product work and honestly most piece of go to market work does contribute to revenue but not everybody contributes to the revenue generation part. A lot of people contribute to the preservation and the sustenance of revenue. How can you contribute to each of these buckets? So just to give you a simple example, we've all been in a situation where a customer says, if you had this feature, I would buy your product. Or because of this feature, I went from free to paid on your self-serve plan. That is an example of product actually generating revenue. You can actually say I have anecdotes and I have data that shows this led to revenue. How can you help with preserving revenue? If you actually observe user behavior and you create segments of users and say, these are my basic users, these are my power users, these are my most advanced users, you will find that your more most advanced users usually correlate with stickiness and upsell and expansion. And so the features that drive people to do more with your product, in essence, help preserve the revenue you have. So you can have product work that is a retention driver. Now, the last one is the most interesting, and this is where uh, the platform and infrastructure product folks should get excited, which is if you can actually control the costs to serve, and if you can give pricing flexibility to your sales team through platform and infrastructure product work, you can actually influence margins as well, right? You can keep all the customers you have and improve the margin headroom you have by serving them with cheaper infrastructure, better infrastructure, et cetera. So these are the three different ways you can actually connect to revenue. Now, the exercise on Twitter and the topic of this talk was not just give me a high level framework for how leadership thinks. The exercise was how do I actually connect my day-to-day -day product to those revenue metrics. So if you think about these three buckets, most of you are not juggling with growth, retention, and margins on a day-to-day -day basis. What you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is probably something like daily active user, NPS score, time to go live, number of customers using this feature, upsell conversion rate, click-through rate, local operating metrics that your teams have a handle on and through your product work can show causal impact and growth week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter, whatever your time horizon is. That's the world you live in, not this world, right? And these are some examples of those metrics. Probably a lot of these are gonna look familiar to you and I'm sure folks in the audience could come up with dozens more. The point here is not to have an exhausting list of metrics, it's to acknowledge this is the altitude we as product managers are operating at, and the altitude that leadership wants to operate at is growth, retention, and margins. So how do you connect these two very different altitudes? So I wanna introduce the concept of what I call strategic levers. 
which is you can break down these top level business KPIs, growth, retention, and margins into a couple of buckets each. Where does growth actually come from? There's two types of growth. There's user growth and there's revenue growth. User growth might be a business where you just wanna get broad distribution and then you'll have some other way to convert people from free to paid, right? There's a lot of products that just care about active usage of whatever cadence, daily, monthly, weekly active users, uh, and somehow that's connected to revenue because the bigger your pool of users, ultimately the more people you can monetize. Um, you could also do it more directly, which is just how much revenue am I accruing on whatever cadence I do, ARR, MRR, whatever. Um, so that's growth can be broken down into those two different levers. Retention can actually be broken down as well. You have customer level retention, which is so-and-so was a customer. Are they a customer a month later, a year later, whatever the deal term is, right? But you also have revenue retention, which is they used to pay me $50,000 a year, now they pay me $60,000 a year. Uh, and through that logic, you can actually have greater than 100% retention. So if you've ever looked at an earnings report for a company and said, how do they have greater than 100% retention? It's because the customers they have eventually end up spending more. And that spending more offsets the customers who don't monetize or churn or don't renew or whatever the case might be. And then lastly, on margins, there's two different aspects you can do. One is what I call product pricing. If you price correctly, if you price in a way that's connected to value, or if you price and package in a way that steers people towards higher margin stuff for you, you can affect margins, right? A lot of innovation that a lot of product companies do is around their pricing and packaging. What is included in free, what is included in paid, what is included in enterprise can actually lead to a total book of business that is better or worse depending on those decisions, right? And those decisions can change over time based on market conditions, competitor, user behavior, et cetera. And then lastly, I hinted at this earlier, is service costs. If you can actually reduce the cost of serving your users and your use cases, you're actually gonna make more money, right? Because it costs you less to serve them. And many a company has been built on having an amazing insight on how to solve a problem for cheap. Now in our industry, we've been very, very focused until the last couple of years on just growth. But over the last 18 to 24 months, you've seen definitely a push from leadership, investors, analysts saying, what is your retention story? What is your margin story? Because people wanna know, is this business a viable business, not just a high growth business? So this idea of strategic levers is very, very important because it is the connection between the KPIs that your leadership team cares about, like growth, retention, and margins, and the day-to-day -day metrics that your team sees. Now, I see a lot of people taking pictures. Uh, if you follow me online, you've seen versions of this slide many a time, so this is not some secret sauce. The slides will be available later. You can find the same kind of content on LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. Uh, but if you wanna take pictures, I, I don't wanna stop you. Um, so this is how you connect the dots here. And it's really, really important to use this as a translation layer when you're engaging with your leadership team. So if your leadership team comes along and says, how are we doing on revenue? You then ask, what kind of revenue? If your leadership team says, I care about customer retention specifically, you can say, these are the things we're doing for customer retention. Now, this framework, like most frameworks, the more you use it, the more value it starts to produce over time. For example, you might notice two different teams working towards the same metric. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Should they join forces? You might notice somebody driving a metric that doesn't really connect to anything. Should that team even exist? You might have a situation where you think driving active usage so that you have more free users to convert to paid is the number one thing you could do as a company. But it turns out that's like the number 10 thing from an investment perspective. You can then reallocate investments to focus on the things you care about. It's really a device to have strategy and execution conversations from top to bottom, right? And so just to summarize this in a pyramid, one of my goals for this year was to use this pyramid visual, so I'm forcing it here, <laughs> is at the topmost level are the business KPIs that leadership cares about, in the middle are those strategic levers, 
And at the bottom is the North Star operating metrics that you as a day-to-day -day PM deal with. Those business KPIs are lagging. They are ultimately what people care about. They are what is connected to outcome, but they don't shift day over day, right? If you had a chart for retention and you looked at it every day, I guarantee you it wouldn't change. And so those are too long-term horizon to look at regularly. The levers go one click deeper. So the levers are things that move on three, six, nine month horizon. So they're great for organizing your teams, for deciding your priorities, for setting goals, right? And then lastly, the North Star metrics, assuming the whole ladder connects top to bottom, are how you organize and prioritize and stack rank things locally. So you can say, I have three product ideas. This idea is going to lead to the most active user growth, so I'm going to do that because I believe active user growth ultimately correlates to revenue growth, and my leadership team has said that's my number one priority, right? Um, so this is a framework to help you sort of organize and do that. Now, I want to go back to this decision tree. If you remember our Twitter thread, it was I have to connect to revenue, I have multiple inputs, I have an incomplete picture, I want a single metric, I want to track it and report it. Do it, does it actually correlate and cause a little impact? And I want to focus on outcomes over impact. So I want to share two parting thoughts here. The first is, like with any good framework, there are best practices. The best practices for this framework I shared with you are you want to make sure you use the ladder to tell a story from top to bottom or from bottom to top. If the story doesn't make sense, you need to go back to the drawing board. And the first time you introduce a concept like this, you will find maybe leadership hasn't thought about what levers they want to push. Maybe a team doesn't really have a handle on a metric. Maybe we never really proved the causal impact of something. And so the, the first part of this is use the ladder to your benefit. The second part is those levers in the middle, they force you to make strategic prioritization decisions. They are a way for you to go to your leadership and say, what matters more right now? retention or new revenue growth? And your leadership team should be able to answer those questions if they've done that thinking. If they struggle, you might actually go to them with a buffet and say, I have a product team, I have one designer, seven engineers, me, researcher, scientist, whatever, and say, we could do A, which we think will lead to this much impact on the levers, or we could do B, what sounds like a better story to you? So use that to sort of force a decision from your leadership team and to talk through trade-offs, right? In the interest of simplicity, you are definitely gonna leave out aspects of a metric, but that's really, really okay to do because the most important thing is generally that it passes the sniff test, that everybody is able to understand and reason about the metric, that everybody in your organization can easily track it, report it, dissect it, understand the drivers of it, and come up with new hypotheses for how to move it, right? I would rather all of you have a metric that is generally agreed upon and generally connects to the right dots and improve on it over time versus analysis paralysis of trying to come up with the one composite perfect end all be all metric. It just doesn't exist. Um, and it's very, very important that your learning rituals surface that. So in your learning rituals, you should be talking about what is the work we're doing? How do we know it connects to the metric? show that the metric is moving up or down, and iterate, iterate, iterate. And at every logical juncture, whether it's twice a year, annual planning, whatever the cadence is, you should have a conversation of, is this metric no longer serving us, right? Now, I mentioned best practices. There are also some worst practices or anti-patterns. Uh, and you saw this in the Twitter thread. One is to just adopt revenue as your metric. It's a very bad idea. For a product team to say revenue is our metric, I've been there, I made that mistake myself. You will then become very uh, emotionally attuned to the ups and downs of your sales cycle, and it can become very demoralizing for your product team. Because when you win big deals, you're an amazing product team, and when you lose a customer, you're a terrible product team, but we all know that's not true. Um, there's a lot that goes into actually booking the revenue or keeping the revenue beyond just the product, right? So don't fall for the direct attribution trap. Um, the second is what I call peanut buttering, which is you go to your leadership team and say, well, what matters more, growth, retention, or margins? And they say, all of it, all of it matters. Actually, all of it doesn't matter. You have to choose because somewhere out there is a competitor who is choosing, who is making a hard trade-off decision and a hard priority call, and you have to be prepared for that situation. Third is what I call anecdata, which is you hear from one customer 
that this feature is the reason they bought or upsold, and then that becomes the driving force. Anic data is not the same as data, right? I'm not saying qualitative data is not useful, but even qualitative data needs to be reconciled. Um, I mentioned earlier, you might have stray teams, teams that actually don't contribute to any metric or any outcome for the business, and they should be consolidated and collapsed. Um, we also talked about composite metrics, which is trying to jam everything into a metric to tell a complete story, and that's just not going to work. And then lastly, I think the number one thing when it comes to a metric is you want it to be legible. You want everybody to look at a metric and say, oh, I think I know what this is tracking. I know how to reason about it, and I have some ideas on how to explore it further. Um, so that's sort of everything I had in terms of best practices and anti-patterns. I want to leave you with a couple of actionable things because I am at about that time. Um, the first is I love to connect with people, so you can always find me online. We can have a conversation. If you enjoyed what I shared today, I have a newsletter where I share more of these types of ideas, and I even teach classes about it. And so that's a URL where you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm at Ipscribe on Twitter. My newsletter on Substack is called Run the Business, and I teach a course on Maven. That is my time, uh, and I will hand it over to Rebecca again. <laughs>